You see, the thing is, I don't really like people, is the way she starts. And I know that can't be a good thing because she has this look in her eyes that says she means it and that she isn't exactly prepared for anyone to disagree with her, so I don't. Her eyes are a hard steel gray with flecks of blue and plenty of red lines running through the whites and what's usually called crow's feet spreading out like fans from the outer corners and these huge round eyeglasses with thick black rims. The lens is extremely clean. So clean, it would have been easy to believe that there was no glass there at all and no sign of anything resembling a soul in the eyes behind the lenses. And since the eyes are supposed to be the windows to the soul, that's where you'd expect to see a sign, if there were one. And I don't like you, she continues, which stands to reason, given her previous statement, and which, again, leaves little or no room for a response. So again, I stay quiet and try to find a reason to feel good about this conversation. So sit down in there, stay out of my way, and don't make any noise. And then she turns her back on me as if I wasn't even there, which, in a sense, I'm not, since I never seem to really be anywhere, even when I'm right where I'm supposed to be, which is almost always, since I don't have enough initiative to take any sort of independent action. After that, it sounds like she might be whistling, but not anything you could call a melody, or that you'd care to hear again, or that you could even remember more than five minutes after the fact. It's always at moments like this, moments of stress or moments when there's a sense that something significant is going to happen, that I think about completely meaningless things like which one of the Beatles was really the most important in terms of the long-term success and relevance of the band? Or why has no one ever made another movie as funny as The Jerk? Or how much of a loser does someone have to be to want to go on the Dr. Phil show? and tell their most intimate secrets in front of a television audience of several million. I can't see her anymore. She's gone around a corner, but I can still hear her breathing, wheezing, really. And now I think that's probably the same sound I heard before that I thought was whistling, but now I can tell it's that she's having trouble breathing, so there's probably no chance she could catch me if I ran. But then I think, what if she's got a gun in that bag, and I'd have to go past where she is now to get to the door, so if she does have a gun, she'd have an easy shot. I'm not really interested in finding out how much a bullet wound hurts. I hear the bell over the door ring, and her wheezing stops suddenly, and I'm not quite sure whether it's because she went out or someone came in and startled her, but then I hear her voice say, It's about time, and another woman's voice responds, Shut up, and then the first one, He's in there, keep an eye on him, and the second one again, Whatever and her, don't whatever me, you little bitch. I'll have you for lunch. Now get in there and make sure he doesn't move. Then I hear a gunshot. The bell over the door rings again, and then nothing. No more wheezing, no footsteps, no talking, nothing. So I get up and take a look around the corner, and there she is, the one with the big round glasses and the empty eyes. She's lying there in the middle of the floor on her back. Her eyes are wide open, staring at the ceiling, and not really looking any different than they did before, except that now the glasses are lying on the floor next to her. One of the lenses is shattered, and there's some blood splattered on them from the hole in the middle of her forehead where the bullet went in. The reason there's no more wheezing sound is that she's not breathing, which I can tell because her chest isn't rising and falling. I step over her, pull the door open, the bell rings. I walk across the lobby of the office building and out the door, out into the bright sunshine reflecting off the windows of the skyscraper across the street, the sound of car horns blaring and wind whistling, and just the general hum of a modern American city. Clusters of people passing in both directions, bumping into each other and bouncing off in new directions like electrons and protons in a reactor. And I wonder, what would it take? What sort of pressure would have to be applied to make all those little electrons and protons explode and blast themselves into space and seed the cold, dark universe with love and the milk of human kindness. <laughs>